uh, uh, bottom up. It has to be done also top down. And um, uh, I was uh, asked to uh, tell my personal experience, but I think that would be too lengthy <laughs> uh, for this um, program. But uh, I would like to uh, introduce my mother, uh, who, without whom I wouldn't uh, be here, not only in this world, but in uh, Croatia today, because uh, she, um, 50 years ago, she was uh, impregnated by uh, a Croatian uh, and uh, she tried uh, to have an abortion since she was uh, alone and uh, at that time, obviously, it was not uh, allowed. And so uh, she was denied uh, a healthcare uh, right that we in Denmark today uh, take for granted. Um, Later, when she had to give birth, she was forced uh, a medical help in that uh, all single women were um, gathered and uh, were uh, forced to give birth in the biggest hospital in Copenhagen uh, uh, with very high scientific standards because they were part of a uh, research project where you documented and collected data from these single women. And so, uh, Trying to get the legal or other um, medical services that she needed, she was denied. But on the other hand, she was forced to give birth in a hospital. Uh, and it is supposedly the safest, in medical terms, the safest hospital. Um, however, the birth record that you see from my mother, it's documenting a regular first time birth. She's 21 years old, single. 11 hours for a first birth, it's not uh, <clears throat> really bad and there's nothing documented but when you hear her speak about it. And now she's unfortunately unable to speak but uh, this was before she was uh, a stroke survivor. Uh, she's telling me that um, she was left alone in this big uh, safe hospital. She was left alone for the majority of her birth. And when she felt the need to relieve herself, she was given a, a bedpan uh, on which to sit and uh, do what she had to do. And next time somebody came into the room, she was lying on the floor because she had fell, <coughs> fallen off the bedpan down onto the floor and my head was already out. So um, birth in our family has always been uh, <coughs> very uh, complicated and so when I myself became a midwife uh, it's, uh, and started uh, doing home births I've been doing home births for four years uh, in a country where luckily uh, hearing from you in Croatia and, and other places uh, home birth is every woman's right in Denmark and as a midwife and a doctor you not only have uh, an obligation or you not only um, you're obligated even if you recommend that it's not uh, safe for them, you're obligated to assist them. So I can see now that uh, that's something that uh, one should not take for granted. Um, however, that does not mean that uh, abusive uh, practices does not take place uh, and that uh, midwifery, as it is practiced in hospitals, could not be improved upon. After having done home births for four, <coughs> for four years, I'm now working in a hospital in Sweden due to some economic circumstances um, and um, I have experienced a radicalization uh, after coming back into the hospital systems because having seen what birth can be for women, not only a medically uh, defined safety but also a spiritual and a sexual and um, well, a social safety is required and I'm hoping that through these new initiatives uh, and the, uh, the emerging knowledge of what birthing hormones are involved, that we can persuade some um, that are uh, forming the policies, that we can persuade them that it is not a luxury um, that you can talk about after safety is in place. It is something that in fact promotes even the uh, the birthing process physiologically and uh, so my hope is that uh, with uh, 
this uh, collaboration on all levels, uh, not just consumer levels, because we have been screaming and shouting, and it seems to me that home birth midwives anyway, that we are preaching to the choir, and uh, it's very important that we have uh, the backup and the, uh, the ear of international specialists and organizations to help us promote normal birth with women. And um, I will now go on to presenting Sorry. Um, um, uh, Daniela Fortunova, who is uh, an attorney at law um, and has worked with um, uh, the Bulgarian um, Protection of Human Rights in Bulgaria and with the Health Commission in uh, Bulgaria. Is that right? Well, yeah, thank you a lot. I've been working with Bulgarian Helsinki Committee. I'm uh, I'm a lawyer. I've been working with Bulgarian Helsinki Committee since my graduation, so uh, that's my whole life. And uh, we do human rights uh, there, and recently I'm um, also attracted in uh, women's rights in childbirth, and I also take part in initiatives of the Bulgarian organizations that uh, cope with that problem. So here I am with you now, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, to see that uh, we are all interested in uh, what's really problematic and I'm very sad that I couldn't really take part in the show yesterday and today because uh, I have uh, two crying children with me and I think uh, I will soon have one crying father as well. <laughs> so this is the reason I start first and will be very, very short, I hope. If I'm uh, too long, please start uh, throwing some of the Eastern eggs at me so that I know that I have to <clears throat> cut my presentation. Uh, it will be about... Uh, some of the cases of the European Court of Human Rights that I found interesting. So it's not an exhaustive overview of the case law of uh, the Strasbourg Court. Um, just we will mention um, some of the cases precisely in these fields. Um, <coughs> Of course, I'm not going to uh, talk about home birth because we've already spoken about this. Uh, Ternovsky uh, case, you know all about it, and the speakers uh, after me will speak a lot about this case and the cases afterwards. And due to, uh, I have to shorten my presentation, then um, I decided just to to cover the, the other four aspects, which is informed consent for medical and related procedures, uh, the removal of a newborn baby from the mother, access to personal medical records, and the issue of uh, burial of stillborn babies. These issues um, are covered uh, by Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And uh, under this article, the court also have heard, has heard cases about abortion, as we know, about surrogacy um, and other matters which are related to uh, parental rights. But uh, we are not going to talk uh, about these issues too. Also, uh, problems may arise uh, within uh, Article 3, as in the cases of sterilization we are going to talk about a little bit. And also problems have uh, arisen in uh, Article 10, which is uh, the freedom of speech article. Uh, first of all, that's uh, Article 8 for those who are not uh, aware. It protects the rights uh, to private and family life. And um, in order um, for this our right to be protected, the state should not interfere. And if it interferes, then uh, this interference would be justified only if it's an, in accordance with the law, meaning that there is some basics in the law about this interference and is necessary in a democrat democratic societies for the following aims, which are uh, written there, national security, public safety, in our um, case more important uh, economic well-being of the country, um, health, morals, and the right and freedoms of uh, others. So um, the, te the court is doing this test, verifying whether this interference could be justified. 
and if not, then uh, it finds violation of uh, Article 8. The first case we are going to um, talk about is Kono Konovalova versus Russia. It's about an authorized presence of medical students during the birth of the applicant's child. So Konovalova was uh, admitted in hospitals with uh, her contractions already started. She was handed a brief notice on a um, leaflet saying that uh, perhaps there might be medical students uh, attending uh, the treatment of her and her delivery as part of their clinical studies. And when the time for delivery came, she uh, tried to um, protest against uh, this uh, involvement of students, but uh, they nevertheless uh, was, were there and presented her, uh, um, the birth of her child. Uh, what is important here is uh, that the government in the proceeding of before the court had submitted that uh, the student pre uh, presence did not amount to an interference within the applicant's private uh, life since Konovalova had implicitly given her consent uh, as she has never um, objected to her treatment in the hospital. Moreover, the government says uh, the students were just observing, uh, they were not taking part in the uh, procedures, so uh, she could not um, uh, claim that she has been um, a victim within the, the meaning of um, that article and that there has been any interference. Uh, the court disagreed uh, with that, saying uh, precisely this, which I think is very important from our point of view, that the applicant learned of the presence of medical students during the birth the day before between two sessions of drug-induced sleep, when she had already been for some time in a state of extreme stress and fatigue on account of her prolonged contractions. Things. It is unclear whether the applicant was given any choice regarding the participation of students in this occasion and whether in the circumstances she was at all capable of making an intelligible and informed decision. So the court took in consideration the uh, vulnerable position of that uh, woman and uh, disregarded the um, uh, statement of the government. The court noted that uh, the presence of students was authorized in the uh, law, but the shortcoming that it found was that the law did not provide any safeguards to protect patients' privacy rights. Namely, Konovalva uh, did not have the right under the law to give her consent. This right was uh, introduced just lately, after Konvalova was already a victim of, um, of her uh, in this case. So the, the court found violation of uh, Article 8. As um, time uh, passes very fastly, next, time, next things we will talk about is uh, involuntary sterilization of Roma women. These are among the cases that uh, um, treat that question. Um, so, these cases of sterilization are important not only because they concern reproductive rights, but because uh, the sterilization itself has, had happened during the C-sections of the applicants, so that the court also made some important comments on, uh, on that. Um, also about the informed concern, bearing in mind that, uh, in, for example, in their last stage of delivery, the, the woman is not that uh, uh, consentful, so that uh, we all could think about this in our future uh, litigations. So, in short, uh, in all these cases of involuntary sterilization of uh, Roma women, the court found First of all, violation of Article 3, which is the prohibition of uh, ill treatment, and also violation of Article 8, because uh, the government uh, had, uh, uh, did not provide uh, effective legal safeguards to protect the reproductive health of Roma women, meaning uh, um, it breached it, its um, uh, positive obligation to, to protect the, life, the, the health of these women. 
Informed consent uh, is also an issue in uh, these cases against uh, versus Turkey, which concern forceful uh, gynecological examination. I will just uh, take a short overview over one of uh, the cases. Uh, so, uh, YF is um, the husband of the uh, woman who has been in custody um, in Turkey, and she has been ill-treated there in custody. And um, after the um, detention, she was examined by a gynecologist against her will. So um, the government tried to say that uh, it's not like this. She has been uh, given her consent uh, purely because uh, she could have objected to the examination when she was taken to the uh, doctor's consulting room, but uh, the court uh, accepted uh, another view, uh, uh, namely that uh, the court considered that in the circumstances the applicant's wife could not have been expected to resist submitting to such an examination in view of her vulnerability at the hands of the authorities who exercise complete control over her thought, uh, over her and her detention. Um, basically, in this case, uh, it was also found, the court also found violation of Article 8 as uh, the measure was not in accordance with uh, the law in uh, Turkey. Uh, next uh, is uh, the issue, very problematic issue, uh, which was dealt in a very old case of the European Court of Human Rights. But um, in fact, this case is not that prominent, not that popular, although I think it's very important uh, to us, and I'm th thankful to Elena Ativa that she has uh, showed it to me. Um, it's um, very uh, interesting because the court has uh, said in this case that the removal of a newborn from the mother is a draconian step. Um, it's a very harsh uh, intervention and um, there should be really good reasons for a removal of a baby from uh, the mother just after the, the, the mother has given birth to that baby. So the case concerns a woman, the applicant P, with a personality disorder who has um, uh, hurt her child her previous child in the United States. So coming, uh, going to England, she marries uh, C and they have their daughter S. Uh, and at the birth of S, uh, some hours after S was uh, um, born, uh, there was uh, emergency uh, removal order issues by the authorities and the baby was taken away. Um, the court considers that the removal of a baby from its mother at birth requires excep exceptional justification. It is a step with a traumatic, uh, so traumatic for the mother and places her own physical and mental health under strain. It deprives the newborn baby of close contact with its natural mother and father and uh, of the advantages of uh, breastfeeding. The court continues saying that even on the assumption that P might be at risk to the baby, her capacity and opportunity for causing harm immediately after the birth must be regarded as limited, uh, considerably more uh, limited than, than once she was discharged. Why limited? Because she has undergone C-section, she was um, in bed, uh, there, was, there could have been supervision by the uh, staff at the hospital, but the staff at the hospital refused to take such measures. And this was found by the court to be disproportionate. And this is why the court um, found um, um, violation of uh, that the Article 8 has been violated. I find uh, the following cases also very uh, interesting. Uh, they um, show 
what would happen if the parents are not uh, has not have not given their informed um, consul, uh, concern um, consent about uh, what would happen with the, um, their stillborn child, whether um, and how to uh, do to what to, to do in order to make the funeral of their stillborn children. In uh, marriage versus Croatia, what happened was that the wife of the applicant gave birth of a child, which uh, she was already nine months pregnant. Uh, the child was stillborn. The mother and the father was in uh, shock after the delivery, so that they said that they would not um, um, take care of um, the, the body of their stillborn child and left it to the hospital to uh, make the funeral. However, the hospital did not inform uh, when the funeral has taken part and uh, on contrary, uh, even they did cremation, which uh, the applicant didn't want to, to, to have taken place. So they, uh, the applicant didn't know where the, the um, body of the child has been bur uh, buried. And that's the problem and that's the interference uh, that uh, the, the court found, uh, saying that um, in, an area, in an area as personal and delicate as the management of the death of a close relative where a particular high degree of diligence and uh, prudence must be exercised, the court does not consider that by relying on an oral agreement with the hospital that it would take care of the burial of his uh, stillborn child, the, the applicant tacitly accepted that the child's body would be disposed of together with the other uh, clinical waste, leaving no trace of the remains or uh, their whereabouts. So, um, in fact, the uh, authorities have followed the procedure in law, which applies to f fetuses, which are pregnancies under the 22nd uh, week of uh, mo the mother being pregnant. And they applied the same procedure to a uh, child, which, is, which was born close to uh, its um, term. So uh, that was the problem. That was violation of the uh, in internal law. And this is the reason why the court found violation of Article 8. Finally, uh, there are um, three cases uh, co concerning personal medical record. The first one against uh, Slovakia um, treats the problem of uh, eight women or Roma women who could not take photocopies of their uh, records, medical records by the hospital. So uh, they were and their attorneys were only allowed to make uh, uh, handwritten ex ex excerpts of, uh, of uh, what are the medical records, which was uh, not satisfactory for the applicants. So this is why the court uh, concluded that in cases like the present one, where personal data are concerned, um, the scope of Article 8 has to be um, has to include also the right of these people to be available to take um, copies, printed copies of uh, their data files. And um, what is uh, more important is that the court considered, uh, does not consider that data subjects should be obliged to spe specifically justify a request to be provided with a copy of their personal data files. It is rather for the authorities to show that there is a compelling reasons for refueling, uh, refusing this uh, option. And the last two cases uh, to mention con uh, concern transmission of personal medical records of uh, the applicants to um, authorities. So one authority asks uh, transfer personal medical records of uh, the applicant to another one. And while in the first case there was no violation of Article 8 because the, the court found that uh, uh, this transfer of information has been justified because the applicant uh, has uh, 
uh, made a claim for compensation of uh, her back injury and the uh, authority, namely the insurance uh, body, uh, had to verify whether her allegations were correct that she really had this uh, back injury during work. Then this uh, authority asked the hospital to provide uh, information about um, uh, the treatment of the applicant um, in the hospital and this information included also abortion and reading the, the files of the abortion uh, the insurance uh, authority un understood that um, in fact the back injury did not stem from um, injury at work but has been a, a chronic disease of the applicant. Last case, um, it's a recent case from last year against uh, Latvia uh, is close in the facts to the previous one but here the court found that there is a violation of article 8 uh, because the authority that collected uh, information about the um, circumstances uh, under which the applicant he had given uh, birth and the applicant was sterilized during her uh, C-section and she wanted to uh, make litigation against the hospital that, uh, and the doctor that made this sterilization without her consent. So she made that uh, uh, lawsuit uh, and at the outset of that lawsuit the um, hospital asked Madeki, which is uh, um, body who supervises the treatment provided in hospitals to make an independent report on what has happened in that, uh, on that day. Uh, however, uh, the, found, uh, the, co the court found this um, mm, to be a violation of Article 8 because Madeki did not have uh, uh, competence in, in doing so during uh, uh, litigation already started and uh, the scope of the data it received uh, was uh, uh, disproportionate to the, the problem uh, itself. So it received uh, information from three hospitals which was not uh, really at all relevant to, to what has happened. Thank you for your attention and more you will read later on. I think we don't have any time. No? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> the next presenter is uh, Felicia uh, Vin Vinci, uh, who has a Master of Science in Physics uh, from the um, uh, University of Zsegyet, Hungary, and also a Master of Science in Midwifery uh, from Utah. Uh, and uh, you have, also, and she also has uh, a midwifery practice in Hungary um, now, uh, and um, started working with the ministry uh, on the legislation of uh, home birth. Is that right? Uh, I don't know. Oh, so she, Hello. She will be joining us um, uh, online here. Hello? Hello? Are you with us? Yes, this is Felicia. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> you may start your presentation. Uh, did you hear m me presenting you? Uh, just a part of it. <laughs> just a part of it. Well, uh, you, you take my word for it. <laughs> I have presented oh. you, and if you will please uh, uh, start your presentation now. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having me and letting me uh, present online. I'm Felicia uh, Vince. I live in Hungary and uh, work as a midwife. Uh, I studied in the United States uh, uh, midwifery and uh, we moved back to Hungary in 2009. Uh, until 2011, home birth in Hungary was not regulated and uh, this was good from one point of view and risky from another. It was good because it meant less administration and cheaper practicing 
but it was also bad because this issue was put on the uh, periphery, which made it difficult for both the midwives and families. As with almost everything in life, the need for change came from uh, tragedy. A bad outcome is always interesting, but of course nobody cares if everything is going fine. Due to the events uh, around Agnes Garib and uh, pressure from the European Union, the government finally issued the regulation of out-of-hospital births in 2011. It was a dramatic change that meant a lot of hardship for midwives. Uh, the regulation included such requirements uh, that were not possible to fulfill at that point. More meetings and coordination followed with the government and a new change in the regulation in January of 2012 resulted in the situation that we have today where you can get licensure for home births. I feel that the regulation is uh, correct and stands in line with other countries' regulations. The difficulties we had in the beginning was finding uh, an insurance company willing to make a liability contract with us and finding a, uh, and finding a collaborating pediatrician. Since there was only one insurance company that offered the contract, it could give uh, as high a price as it wanted to. However, it was still doable. Finding a pediatrician uh, in Southeast Hungary who is willing to perform an exam on a newborn within 24 hours after birth seemed impossible. I got many rejection and criticism from doctors. And uh, first I had to back to a doctor to come and <clears throat> examine the baby. But then I found a ne ne neonatologist who is very supportive and I am very grateful for this. So this is on a good track now. Uh, despite the regulation, we still have to face many problems on a daily basis. Uh, first of all, if a doctor, health visitor, pediatrician, physician, or even the cleaning lady in a hospital or clinic hears that a woman wishes to give birth to her own child out of hospital, uh, they will tell her she is responsible, irresponsible, uh, she wants to put the life of her baby at risk for her, for her own comfort. She is selfish, stupid, and this whole craziness should be stopped by force. And, and uh, the government made a huge mistake when they regulated home births because it legalized something that actually should vanish uh, from the face of the earth. I had clients who didn't dare choose home births after an insult like this, and uh, I think this is extremely unfair and that this kind of behavior should, vanish, should be vanished because what we do is legal. We are trained to attend home births. We care more for the mothers and babies and families than most of the care providers in hospitals. And on top of everything else, they don't even know what home birth is, the requirements we have to fulfill, the instruments we carry, and uh, of course, they have never even seen a home birth or even talked to someone who did. <clears throat> Another difficulty is the price. Uh, home birth families have to pay a lot of money for this service. It is around uh, 200,000 forints. Uh, which is about a month's salary for a middle-class family where both parents work. The amount that the hospital gets after a vaginal birth is about, is, uh, about half of this. It clearly means uh, that there is a problem with the financing of, financing of hospital births that should be solved because uh, it seems that that is underfinanced. And of course, home births should be financed by the government because the health insurance system is socialized in Hungary. In Hungary, we pay every month for health care. That also includes birth care. <clears throat> Another great step by the health ministry was uh, establishing the possibility for midwives to give prenatal care for low-risk mothers. It was a great step uh, because it made uh, providing holistic care possible, allowing us to provide care for the mother and baby from the beginning of her pregnancy through childbirth till the end of the postpartum period. Naturally, this is not going smoothly either. The first step is the risk assessment of the mother that has to be performed by an obstetrician. 
as you can imagine, if an obstet uh, obstetrician finds out that the mother wants to choose a midwife uh, as her uh, provide care provider, he will do everything he can to stop this, and we are categorized the mother as high risk. I have a client who is uh, young and healthy, so the doctor couldn't find uh, any reason to say she was high risk, yet he still put her in the high risk category, saying that she, is, she was emotionally unstable. After the regulation of home births, uh, my practice was established in December 2011 and got licensed on March 12, 2012. The first legal home births <clears throat> of my practice and also in Hungary happened in Szeged, in southeastern uh, Hungary on March 19, so a week later uh, uh, after uh, my licensure. We had about 550 home births since then, with about 15% ending with a hospital transport. Most of the time, uh, transfer of care went smoothly. However, in some cases, it was problematic. Either the parents got criticism for, they, for their choice, or we, the midwives, were rebuked. A year and a half ago, I opened my birth center, which became very popular, not just because most people still feel that someone having a baby should go away from home, but also because it fulfills uh, the requirement, uh, one of the requirements uh, too, that uh, there is a hospital with an OB ward uh, where the mother or baby can be uh, transported within 20 minutes of the place of birth. Since we live in the country, uh, there are villages and farms from where there is no institute within 20 minutes. So they come uh, to my birth center and give birth there and then go home. When I was preparing for this uh, conference, I read your post and I started to feel that we as providers are also affected by this issue. In hospitals, mothers sometimes get abused and their options are extremely limited in Hungary. But we midwives are here too. We get abused verbally and sometimes even physically by, <clears throat> by doctors. Um, I had an un uh, unexpected stillbirth uh, two months ago and uh, that was, <coughs> sorry, that was very traumatic for all of us and we couldn't imagine it, uh, then uh, standing up again. And the next day it was all over the news. They knew my name, my phone number, the place I live and everything about us. Uh, and I <coughs> was thinking that what rights do I have as a midwife? Uh, why don't I have the right that a bad outcome stays within the walls of my practice? Why don't I have the right <coughs> to protect myself, the right for fair treatment? Homebirth midwives are also human beings with human feelings. <coughs> Attending births and helping families is our calling and we <coughs> do it with enthusiasm and this is something that deserves uh, respect. And this is what I plan to, uh, plan to tell you and uh, thank you, thank you for having me at your conference. Hello? Oh, hi, yes? Do you, do you have time to take questions now? Because I know that you, you have to leave soon. Yes? Maybe a couple of questions? Okay. Yes? Should I okay. turn this off then? And then yours uh, is on? I, I, I couldn't hear that. Can you? Use this one. Do you have questions for Felicia? Because she needs to uh, leave uh, right after. So if you have questions now, maybe we can take a couple. No questions? <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Break the ice. Okay. So, um, just following up on the previous presentation, uh, that's often a situation happening, you know. Uh, there is a bad outcome, 
and then a person is criminalized uh, on the media. So what's your perspective and what, what, if you could tell us a little bit more about the states of maybe uh, legislation worldwide in, in terms of protecting um, the privacy of the staff who uh, manage uh, cases uh, or uh, even the, the right of having a proper you know, uh, information in the media. Uh, that's becoming a huge problem in uh, many European countries or even Western European things. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is practically uh, no protection. If you have someone uh, in the media, you know uh, he or she uh, might be willing to, uh, to uh, interview, to make an interview with you and and that might be uh, partly correct, but, uh, but our voice is, is uh, very, very weak in the media. And, uh, and from the uh, legal perspective, uh, I don't know, because this uh, case is still not closed, uh, we are still waiting for, for, for the re results, and uh, we will see what, what uh, if there will be uh, another step and uh, they take the case uh, on a higher level or it will be closed, uh, I am very uh, curious what will happen. I'm sure you all know what happened with Agnes Garib and i just hoping that won't, that, that won't happen again and we will get fair, um, fair treatment and fair um, yes, fair treatment. Um, yeah, I would like, I'm sure the, the attorneys would, would have uh, an answer to that question as well. Um, but let's, let's maybe table that for the end. Uh, um, are there any other questions specifically f for Felicia? Two, maybe we can take one more. I have one question, if uh, I can post one. Uh, being a home birth midwife myself, Felicia, I would like to ask you, um, I usually work uh, under the assumption that if I make a referral uh, that I will be uh, respected and that my judgment will be somewhat honored. Uh, I cannot imagine what it would be like um, and uh, to, to suspect that you will be ill-treated and have you noticed that uh, maybe uh, if you are in doubt that you um, maybe um, defer uh, a referral a little bit longer in uh, subconsciously to avoid this kind of harassment because that makes the outcome of home birth even more. Um, uh, I mean, it must be a, a stress to work under such um, suspicion. Um, do you have any comments on that? Uh, you know, the, Not to suggest the, the, that you're jeopardizing their safety, but I'm, I'm just thinking that it would be hard to uh, maybe refer if you're in doubt, if you think that you will be mistreated. Mm. Uh, the system in Hungary uh, looks like that we, uh, that we uh, can't work just on our own. There, there are other care providers that, uh, who uh, uh, have to be in, in involved at and include, uh, involved in the uh, in the care, and uh, this can be avoided. Um, sometimes we can do that if we uh, if the mother uh, goes to a private doctor, but uh, very few doctors are uh, in on, in this part of Hungary who 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 would collaborate with us, and that's also. Uh, an, ex an expects, expensive way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any more questions or? No. Um, <clears throat> the next presenter will be uh, Rita Benzer. Uh, she is a lawyer at the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union uh, since September 2012 and the direction, uh, director of Patients' Rights and Self-Determination Rights Program. 
she has also worked in the state sector dealing with patients' rights, patient safety and public health, and has been engaged in the protection of the patients' rights in healthcare and public health systems. She is also deeply concerned about the issue of giving birth and home birth, <clears throat> as this is a core issue of self-determination in healthcare. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here on this inspiring conference, and I know that you might get tired, but I hope I can add some interesting information. So I will uh, talk about the legal situation in Hungary after Tarnowski case. Now, in April, uh, we have the fourth anniversary of the decree on home birth. You don't have a presentation? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but the real choice hasn't been given yet. As many of us mentioned before, uh, home birth has been regulated since 2011 in Hungary after the decision in Tarnowski case. The European Court on, of Human Rights emphasized uh, that home birth has to be a real choice for every woman as part of right to respect private life. The core statements of the Ternovsky decision were the following. Firstly, in the Hungarian case, the uh, court held that the right to respect for private life includes the right to choose the circumstances of birth. Secondly, a regulation which imposes fines on midwives assisting at home births uh, constitutes an interference in the exercise of the rights of women and of similarly situated pregnant mothers. Thirdly, according to the court's opinion, the threat of sanctions along with the absence of a specialized comprehensive regulation in this area are detrimental to the women's ability to choose home birth. This in turn constitutes a violation of the uh, legal security for the exercise of privacy rights and in particular violates the principle of legal certainty. We found uh, this judgment to be very important and we were hoping that women can really choose the circumstances of birth. Unfortunately, this is not the case, and not only in regard of home birth or giving birth in hospital, but also in hospitals there is a lack of informed consent. Mothers usually do not get the necessary information, and they cannot even decide in which position they wish to give birth. Uh, home birth uh, is still not financed by the national health care insurance compared uh, to giving birth in state hospitals. That causes that the real choice is not given because of financial circumstances. The situation has also been criticized by the CEDO. The committee expressed its concerns not only about, that the, fact, uh, about the fact that home birth uh, regulation implemented in April 2011 have not provided Hungarian women with a real option for home birth, but CEDO also emphasized that the costs uh, of out-of-hospital births are not covered by the National Health Insurance Scheme, which results uh, in the fact that home birth is available only for wealthy families. The second problem is that midwifery is an, uh, as an independent medical profession has not been legally recognized so far. I will explain the second concern later. Let's concentrate now on the issue of financing. I would just like to give you a comprehensive picture about the Hungarian health insurance. Everybody has to pay some health insurance according to their income. It is mandatory even if you choose a private service. There is only one big state insurance company which is responsible for financing the whole state health care. And there is a, a Hungarian uh, custom uh, which was uh, explained uh, yesterday uh, by Nick also. Uh, patients uh, pay so-called gratitude money to the doctors directly after or even before the service. So the healthcare is far from being free, but if somebody wishes to give birth at home, she has to pay extra fee for the midwives. In 2010, 
together with other uh, organizations like Alternatal Foundations, Doctor uh, for Free and Secure Birth, and Birth Health Association, we formed an opinion how home birth should be regulated. Already then, we pointed out uh, that the regulation should be reconsidered uh, every two years. Unfortunately, there was not a wide range or, of, uh, or debate or discussion between uh, the healthcare government and the professionals after creating the decree. But it would not only be useful but necessary to exchange the everyday life experience of midwife, midwives and adjust the law uh, according to their point of view. There have not been real changes uh, since then, only a few less important modifications. There is a long list in the decree which contains uh, the causes of exclusion of home birth. It hasn't been changed. Uh, we are aware that this is a medical question, but in our point of view, the regulation should be more flexible it would uh, be desirable to decide in every single situation individually and not to decide a prior to the case. We also emphasized uh, that a professional protocol has to be created. It is crucial to involve midwives so that uh, they uh, could create an appropriate protocol according to their everyday life experience. This protocol has been worked out. Felicia uh, was one uh, of the developers. It only misses the opinion uh, and the approval of the healthcare government, so we can be happy about it. Uh, I would also like to describe briefly the situation of ambulant birth giving. Although no law does prohibit it, uh, what's more, the right to leave the institution is named uh, patient's rights. It is not the practice. Healthcare professionals at hospitals also use the same rhetoric as pressing the cesarean section and other interventions. The baby is in danger, so they cannot leave the hospital. It is uh, not just because of the medicalized approach, but hospitals get the money from the state insurance if the mother spends at least um, um, 72 hours in the institution. Uh, just uh, to put you uh, a bit in the picture of Hungarian legislation and practice, I would like to highlight that uh, generally we have quite good laws in terms of patients' rights which include uh, informed consent, the right to human dignity, the right to refuse treatment, etc. But in practice, it does not always prevail. What's more, it does not prevail in, more, in most cases. There is still a patriarchal approach, not only during giving birth, but in the whole system. Another core issue is the right uh, to contact during hospital care. It is declared in the law that delivering women have the right to have a person to stay with them. The law does not say that it should be, uh, only, it, it should be only one, but doctors interpret it this way. So uh, that is why women have to choose whether they want their husband or their doulas uh, to stay with them uh, during giving birth. We took actions in this field too. Uh, due to this, uh, there is a reconciliation between doulas and doctors with the support of the National Patients' Rights and Documentary Center. We are also carrying out a campaign which helps uh, the enforcement of the right to contact. It refers not only to the mother's togetherness with their newborn babies and father's presence, but children who have to spend time in hospital. Now, uh, let's turn back to the other concern uh, regarding uh, the recognition of midwives' independence. A petition uh, was sent uh, together with uh, birth house uh, associations uh, to the Committee on Petitions of the European Parliament. Concerning the fact that Hungary hasn't implemented the provisions of Directive 
2005-36 EC into the national legislation and therefore uh, the recognition of professional qualifications uh, with regard to the competence of midwives has failed. The committee has placed the issue on its agenda and held a hearing uh, in uh, 2013. We were assured uh, of the support of the committee and they decided to keep the question open and get in contact with the Hungarian government in order to transpose the directive properly. Our main concerns were, uh, firstly, the directive uh, refers to the professional competence of midwives uh, and in a broader sense uh, to their professional autonomy and independence. Secondly, it has a relevance to do those women uh, who, based on exhaustive and uh, objective information, would like to decide autonomously on where, how, and with whom uh, they want to give birth. This is absolutely important so that uh, self-autonomy and the right to respect private life can prevail. Recently, uh, we have received a reply from uh, the uh, committee and it has declared that the Hungarian legislation does not violate the directive. In their uh, interpretation, the directive doesn't say that midwives have the right to practice independently from doctors. The petty says uh, that it is a member state's uh, competency how to share tasks and responsibilities between midwives, doctors and other healthcare professionals. In our point of view, this is a misinterpretation of the directive, so we are thinking about uh, taking further steps on this, on this issue. And uh, let's uh, talk uh, some words about the public uh, opinion. It hasn't really changed yet. Women and midwives have to face with uh, stigma. There is uh, some uh, fatal home births published every month in the media, but nobody speaks about the unfortunate stories and hospitals. This practice is very harmful because it suggests that home birth is more dangerous compared to giving birth in frame of institutional environment. Uh, I would like uh, to stress that uh, European uh, Court of Human Rights um, said that such regulation which imposes fines on midwives assisting at home births constitutes an interference in exercise of the rights of women and of similarly situated pregnant mothers. Uh, we have to be aware of the fact. Uh, if um, uh, that uh, practice sustains, we are continuously breaching the law and uh, if it's uh, only the midwives assisting fatal home births uh, have to face uh, criminal procedures. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rita, for your presentations. Uh, do you take any questions? Um, or we do Susanna first and then you can have questions for both of them. In the meantime, I will say who Susanna is. Uh, an attorney at law uh, <clears throat> and a lawyer at the League of Human Rights. She is enga engaged in medical law, um, the rights of women and children related to childbirth and parents' rights to freely decide about vaccination. As a member of the legal team, she is involved in the application of Ms. Dubska against the Czech Republic. She has a blog on topics of her interest in Czech. I will try it. Um, hello, my name is Zuzana Kandiliota and I am a lawyer from the Czech Republic. 
Uh, I'm happy to be here and to share uh, our experience uh, uh, at the European Court of Human Rights. I am here also with my colleagues, uh, lawyers uh, from our organization, and my colleague Katerina will, uh, will share later uh, our experience with CEDO. Uh, so uh, I will speak about two cases uh, at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, Dubska case about home birth, uh, uh, that was unsuccessful, um, but it's not final <laughs> yet. And a uh, case Hanzelkovi, uh, uh, and it's about the hospital birth, and uh, we were uh, successful there, and the decision is final. So, at the beginning, uh, I will show you uh, Mrs. Dubska. Uh, she uh, has university degree in uh, geology and German language. Um, we represent her, and there is another applicant, uh, Alexandra Krejzova. Uh, she has another uh, legal representation, uh, and she is a um, manager. So this is a short, uh, short uh, explanation of the whole case. At the beginning, uh, we were uh, really happy <laughs> about the success in Ternovsky case, and we decided to do the same, uh, uh, also to, uh, to bring uh, the same case uh, uh, to the European Court uh, against the Czech Republic, because <laughs> we hoped that the result will be the same. Um, uh, later, another applicant also joined uh, the, uh, our application, or um, she filed another application. Uh, so there are two applicants. Uh, in uh, 2013, uh, a public hearing at the court took place, and uh, a year uh, after, um, a judgment was published, uh, and we were <laughs> really surprised because it was not uh, um, like in uh, Ternovsky case, and uh, this time um, uh, the uh, the court, uh, another another chamber, found no violation of Article Eight. Uh, the decision uh, uh, decision was issued. Uh, by six uh, judges, and one of the judges uh, was contrary. Uh, I would uh, underline this because um, this uh, Belgian um, uh, judge uh, also wrote an excellent uh, uh, dissenting opinion. His name is Lemens, and it's really worth uh, to read it because uh, it explains uh, uh, he explains exactly uh, where the problem uh, lies. Uh, now the uh, case is pending, uh, or no case, our uh, referral request is pending uh, because uh, we wanted to challenge this decision and we wanted to send it to the Grand Chamber. So one month ago we sent the uh, uh, the referral request, uh, and now we are waiting for the decision if, the, if uh, our case will be sent to the Gram Chamber or not, and uh, if, it, if uh, it is referred to the Grand Chamber, we need your cooperation because we would be really uh, glad if you uh, help us to write many amicus courier letters and if you explain to the uh, Grand Chamber why it is so important to um, um, why it is important um, like to. Uh, uh, um, I don't know how to say that, uh, wh why um, the previous uh, decision uh, in Ternovsky case was the right, and uh, why uh, there is violation of uh, human rights and right to privacy of women, and why the women uh, uh, should have the right to choose home birth uh, with, uh, uh, with a healthcare um, professional. Uh, in my opinion, all the conditions uh, are met. Uh, um, 
I mean conditions uh, uh, for the um, uh, referral uh, to the Grand Chamber. It means that the case raises a serious question affecting the interpretation or the application of the Convention. Uh, or a serious issue of general importance. In our case, we uh, uh, highlighted the case law inconsist inconsistency uh, and the right of women to be prevented from ill treatment, which is in hos Czech hospitals uh, really common, and also gender aspects of this case. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I wanted to explain why uh, the court, uh, in our case, uh, decided differ, uh, differently. Uh, the court says that um, um, the state uh, in this uh, area, in this issue, uh, enjoys a wide margin of appreciation. Uh, it means that the state um, uh, has right to decide uh, uh, about a uh, healthcare system and uh, to decide if to allow home births assisted by midwives or not. Uh, and the argumentation of the court is that there is no European consensus uh, on this matter, so uh, uh, it's the reason why every state should uh, decide. Um, so, so I will show you the map because uh, the European Court of Human Rights made a comparative analysis, uh, analysis and the green uh, countries uh, are countries where home births are uh, uh, regulated and are possible under certain conditions. Uh, the uh, grey uh, gray countries are countries where there is no regulation of home birth uh, yellow countries uh, are considering to enact uh, regulation about home births and red countries um, um, in, a, in a red countries a healthcare professional who uh, decide to uh, assist at home births can face sanctions uh, only because of this fact. So uh, it's really seem that uh, there is different approach in Europe and uh, it's not, uh, there is no European consensus. But I think it's really a bad point of view because if, if we see it from another point of view and if we, di uh, if we divide the countries in two groups, uh, first red group where the healthcare professionals uh, face sanctions and the rest where, uh, are, where the home births are uh, or um, uh, regulated or to tolerated and uh, where the state um, uh, does not uh, uh, dissuade uh, healthcare, healthcare professionals from assisting at home births. So uh, I think that there is European consensus. So uh, the uh, court in our case uh, was wrong. Uh, and uh, um, that analysis that was made by the European Court of Human Rights was very interesting for us, so I decided to ask the court to give us their analysis. And uh, I was surprised because they refused to give us this uh, analysis without uh, any reason. Uh, if you see the website of the European Court, you can see the policy of transparency. Uh, so I hoped that it's, uh, it, will, uh, it would not be any problem to ask for that uh, re uh, research. Uh, but uh, I was wrong, uh, so I uh, cooperated with uh, Oxford Pro Bono Publico, which is an, a program of Oxford uh, Law Faculty, and they made uh, an, uh, another analysis for us. Uh, and the analysis showed that the quality of the legislation uh, is not different uh, between like Czech Republic uh, or in other words, that in Czech Republic, the quality of uh, uh, and co uh, the content of the legislation is not different from uh, states, uh, which are uh, by the European Court uh, considered as uh, states uh, that uh, 
allow uh, home births under certain conditions. So, uh, I mean England and Wales, Italy, France and Sweden, because there is only implicit, not explicit regulation, and the regulation is uh, just based on self-determination, private life and human dignity of women, and uh, on professional standards and competencies of midwives. And in the Czech Republic, we have also the same, uh, we have also the same, uh, um, same legislation and uh, laws, so um, we also uh, send, we also use this argument in the referral request because uh, the um, the home birth ban is not the question of quality of legislation, it's the question of um, um, like power of certain uh, interest group like uh, doctors in Czech Republic. So uh, th this is another case uh, of uh, Mrs. Hanzelkova. Uh, so you can see her. And uh, this, uh, in this case, we were su uh, successful. Uh, Mrs. Hanzelkova uh, gave birth in hospital in, uh, uh, in 2007. And she decided to leave the hospital with her uh, health, uh, healthy baby a few hours after the birth. But the doctors uh, disagreed with this uh, um, decision because it's uncommon in Czech Republic. As Rita said before, uh, also in Czech Republic there is, uh, uh, it's common that uh, mother and baby uh, stay uh, in hospital for uh, at least s uh, 72 hours. And um, we had in Czech Republic before, um, we had um, uh, mi um, something like guidelines of Ministry of Health, uh, a document uh, which uh, said that uh, the newborn should not be uh, uh, discharged from the hospital before that period of 72 hours. But this document uh, was not uh, legally binding, but of course for the doctors uh, uh, it was uh, they had feelings that it's more than law, uh, so uh, it was really enforced on the patients, on, on the women and their babies. Uh, so in this case, uh, the doctors uh, contacted um, child protection service, uh, uh, social workers contacted the court and the court issued a, a, a court decision, uh, interim measure, and uh, Mrs. Hanzelkova um, had to uh, return to the hospital uh, because uh, um, the police uh, with the ambulance came to, the, um, to her uh, home and she was forced to return there. Um, she tried to challenge the uh, court decision uh, in the Czech Republic, but uh, it was not possible because um, she um, uh, she appealed against that decision, uh, but the proceeding uh, was stopped because she was not uh, um, anymore in the hospital because she stayed in the hospital uh, two uh, other two days, uh, but the um, uh, the proceeding uh, at the um, of, of the appellate uh, court um, um, or uh, I, I will explain it in other words uh, um, according to the um, the court it's not possible to uh, like re-examine the decision uh, if there are an, uh, if uh, the reasons um, or <laughs> If uh, if uh, uh, the if she, uh, if the mother is not anymore in the hospital because uh, there there is no reason anymore uh, for uh, re-examination, uh, it's uh, it's a legal problem. But uh, she uh, she could not challenge the decision, and uh, she succeeded at the European Court of Human Rights. No only. Uh, because of violation of the of her right uh, right to uh, uh, 
like private life, but also uh, she um, succeeded also with Article 13, which means right to effective, um, uh, like effective uh, uh, legal protection. Uh, now the decision of the European Court uh, is final, but there is possibility of a renewal uh, of the proceeding before the Constitutional Court, so we are considering this step now. And uh, I'm going to, to the end of my presentation. Uh, what are the impact uh, of these two decisions? Uh, the positive impact is that uh, there is a new working group uh, at the government, uh, Governmental Council uh, for Equal Opportunities. And this working group uh, is uh, well balanced. Uh, there are not only healthcare professionals, uh, but there are also lawyers, sociologists, um, 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 uh, who else? Uh, econ uh, economists. Um, uh, there are many, many uh, experts from different fields. And um, if you read the dissenting opinion of Judge Lemons, uh, you can notice that uh, it's not the first uh, working group in the Czech Republic, uh, but there were uh, two uh, working groups before on the Ministry of Health, but with the uh, most of members, uh, uh, where the most of members were doctors uh, who had uh, no motivation to change the system. So this is different, but unfortunately the working group has no competencies, so uh, we will see uh, uh, what uh, will be the results. Uh, the other positive uh, uh, result is the new recommendation, is the new guideline uh, of ministry uh, uh, regarding the uh, dismissal of newborns from the hospitals. Uh, now there is explicitly said that the parents uh, have the right uh, to uh, uh, um, to leave the hospital also earlier, that the 70, uh, uh, 72 hours uh, are only recommended time, and it's the right of the woman to stay there for that period, but it's not the obligation. The negative uh, impact of the decision Dubska and Krejzova is that uh, it's, um, this decision uh, is understood as confirmation that uh, uh, home birth uh, with uh, uh, health um, health professional is illegal, so it was really uh, um, there is a big disinterpretation because the court, even if uh, the, the court said that um, there is no violation, the court admitted that the uh, Czech hospitals, that the care at Czech hospitals is not so uh, um, respecting and the rights of women are not respected and uh, the court uh, also said that um, the health policy uh, should reflect the legal and medical um, like um, uh, I, no, I, I, I don't remember exact uh, words, but um, like new, um, um, new medical uh, or new scientific evidence. Uh, um, so um, the, the court said that uh, um, the, the state should do some changes. Uh, but uh, unfortunately in the media, uh, the message was, was uh, the uh, was different. Um, and uh, I would like just to mention that we, had, uh, we have now a, a, a really bad uh, experience with European Court of Human Rights uh, because uh, uh, our uh, recent application uh, were uh, found inadmissible without uh, any reason. Uh, uh, or uh, immediately trashed uh, for absurd formalistic reasons that uh, in the, fo the form was fulfilled uh, in another way. But um, if you are interested, I can say you uh, this experience uh, later. Uh, 
uh, if you ask me, uh, recently we also filed an application um, on behalf of, uh, of a midwife who is dissuaded uh, from practicing her profession and uh, it was found immediately inadmissible without any justification or reason. So we are considering to use other international mechanism, for example, a collective complaint to the European uh, Committee of Social Rights. And I spoke with the, uh, our um, Czech constitutional judge, Kateřina Šimáčková, who is very open. Um, so I spoke with her about this situation and uh, her opinion is that European Court of Human Rights is not an appropriate mechanism for bioethical issues because the uh, judges uh, don't understand uh, this uh, issue uh, and also the Article 8 is interpreted very broadly and um, the applicants are trying to put everything uh, under Article 8 uh, and it's the question if private life uh, is so broad how it is interpreted. So her idea is that um, there should be another uh, international body to interpret not the European Convention uh, uh, on human rights and protection, uh, human rights, but uh, Convention on Biomedicine, where, where um, mm, there are more specific articles uh, and rights of the uh, human rights, like uh, right to inform consent. So, <laughs> thank you, and uh, at the end I would, uh, I would like to repeat again that if you uh, like uh, to help us and to join uh, the Amicus Curia letters for the Gram Chamber, uh, contact us, or if you want another of the documents, for example, the research of the uh, Oxford University, which is really uh, interesting, uh, I will send you the documents or our uh, refer uh, referral uh, request as well. So uh, I hope for cooperation. Thank you. We can maybe take just a couple of questions and we have, I just want to remind the attorneys, we have a standing question about the rights of providers um, in, uh, in case of an adverse outcome. What rights do providers have as, as human beings, basically? Let's, yes. maybe we can take some questions. Hello, I'm Glenda from Bulgaria. Um, I would like to come back to your uh, talk about financing the, the system and midwifery care. Um, in Bulgaria, we have a similar, very, very similar system, 99%, uh, for financing medical care in general, as you described, and also for maternity services, with the exceptions that we do not have a home birth midwives, and we do not have midwifery services whatsoever financed, financed separately from the package that goes to the doctor. So midwives receive their um, salaries, through the general package that goes to the hospital or that goes to uh, the doctor's practice. So they are financially subordinated to, uh, to another medical profession, in fact. Um, what do you see uh, are possible ways for overcoming this situation? Uh, how could financing, which goes from the pocket of every single uh, citizen in our countries, uh, to, to the state body that afterwards pays to, uh, to medical professionals. Uh, what are the ways to secure financing for midwifery services? Well, uh, I can think... We, can we uh, have the next question and then you can answer all of them. I'll translate for her. She wants to give the information that France <clears throat> should be in red and not in green on the map. <laughs> and she's, she's been banned by, by the midwifery French Council and she's one of the file that's been rejected by the ACHR like you mentioned, she's been trashed for no reason. 
Because the French judge is an obstacle? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think uh, the best way to see the discrimination between home birth and hospital birth uh, was the easiest way uh, to finance uh, midwives as the same way uh, as doctors, as uh, hospitals. So from the uh, big state budget, uh, from the big uh, and one uh, state insurance, uh, they should uh, get uh, their money for every birth. I think it would be the, the best and the easiest way. Do you want to handle, and there are other lawyers in the room, so please feel free to jump in. Um, we still haven't considered the question of what are the rights of providers in case of an adverse, um, adverse outcome. What rights do providers have, either midwives or doctors? Um, and you, I mean, I'm sure that <laughs> you can Explore more. I can't, I can't speak to European regulations, but I imagine there are some on the national levels that exist like we have in the U.S. that there are legal protections for hospitals that have internal um, in-depth discussions about complicated cases. Um, when we discussed at our hospital extending um, those discussions to home birth midwives so we could share lessons learned, about home birth transfers that did prove very controversial. So they exist within hospitals in the US, but um, as far as I know, only one hospital in the US has been successful in, in involving home birth midwives into those legally protected discussions, which I think is um, quite an advancement. The, the Nordic Association of uh, Midwifery Organization, they actually uh, on the basis of the Agnes Gerwig case, they, they called to the uh, Minister of Health in Hungary to make a revision of the ways that they punish healthcare professionals. And they asked him to look to the Nordic countries because we have a patient complaint system where th that is an official public um, organization that has lawyers, but also people from the healthcare profession. And they actually do all these cases. Um, and we do not have this uh, idea of punishing uh, healthcare per personnel very severely. They, they more look to if people can still be registered. And you know, they are, it's not only doctors who are sitting in these commissions, it's also midwives and nurses and so forth. So they just thought that you should call on the Nordic countries to talk about this. So maybe you should get some specialists from there, I would suggest. I would just like, oh, well. I can talk, yes. Just a small comment to what you were saying, Susanna. I think it's very shocking, actually, that these applications before the European Court are being found inadmissible straight away. And I think we should find a way to create a bigger awareness about that, because I didn't know that, for example. And I think it is very shocking, because we know that the court now has this pri priority system, but we don't know how it's working out in practice, and which cases are found admissible and which are instantly turned down. Uh, also in times of taking time to deal with cases, which are the ones that are put at the back and basically we have to wait for 10 years or longer to find a judgment and which are being dealt with now. So I think we should create awareness about that. I wouldn't be very much in favor of uh, going to different bodies. Like you can go to the Human Rights Committee, for example, you can go to the CEDAW, I can see that. But uh, I think the danger of finding a sort of alternative specialized bodies would be a sort of marginalization of the topic because the real human rights bodies wouldn't be dealing with it. So I think we should try to force the European Court and the Human Rights Committee and the CEDAW Committee to deal with these issues. Um, just a brief comment, uh, to, if I may. Um, what Nick was talking about, and I think it's very important to, to, um, to think about that, is a system where doctors uh, and nurses and midwives, hopefully in home birth, midwives can learn from adverse outcomes and this is what we want to happen. We don't want to necessarily punish everyone that has 
any kind of an adverse outcome, either at the hospital or at home, we, we want accountability and this comes in many forms. It doesn't necessarily come from the European Court of Human Rights. So we have to think about that. Uh, I know that Leah and, okay, and Mary. Thanks, Helena. I'm Leah from the Center for Reproductive Rights. I just wanted to follow up about the European Court and say that I think also it's really important when we consider this case, Susanna, and, and other cases, that we have to situate them in the general approach of the court to reproductive rights and women's reproductive rights in Europe. And the approach of the court is not um, wonderful. We have had some successes and we have had some very negative outcomes. And I think we have to be very strategic about how we use the court and very careful because there's something very negative about a, a bad decision and a bad mm. precedent and it can have both in the local context a very bad impact but also generally for the jurisprudence. I do think that we, for example, at the centre we have had this problem with the si single judge procedure and the uh, inadmissibility findings and the, there is a lot of concern in the general European human rights movement about this new procedure and the lack of transparency and I think we are working to try to see if there are ways how we could push back a little bit and maybe that's something we can talk more about. But I do think in terms of using the other human rights bodies, um, it, it may be an interesting approach and I think, I mean I do think we have to be careful and again very strategic and think through how we would frame the issues, that's really critical. But, for example, we had a very bad decision against Ireland in an abortion case, A, B, and C, a number of years ago. And it was really, really bad in terms of how the court interpreted margin of appreciation and the degree of latitude it gave to the Irish state when, again, compared with the map of Europe in abortion, Ireland has extremely restrictive and punitive laws. Um, and so now what the centre is actually doing is trying to use the Human Rights Committee complaint mechanism um, where we think we have a greater chance of pushing some of these issues and getting good decisions from that body with a view ultimately I suppose of challenging the European Court ultimately right so what are the steps we need to put in place before going to the European Court with with some of these and other complicated reproductive rights issues to make sure that we make it very very hard for the court to give a bad decision um, it's very hard for the court to look if, if there is good jurisprudence from some of the other bodies, it will be more difficult for the court to, to, not, to, to follow its own steps in the past or not to change its jurisprudence. But I would urge in, in all of these matters with an engagement, particularly through litigation with these bodies, that really being very careful about how we move and when we move and, and what issues we bring to them is really critical because otherwise we can get a bad decision from them that then lasts for 10, 15 years and we are all stuck with it. I would like to say that I think it's very important when one of our colleagues is, is still stuck to the neck, uh, stuck take her neck out of the, of the field and makes a mistake that we are joining together the organizations of midwives. And what I see up till now, mostly it is that a, a, a part of the midwifery organization already judges midwives outside of the box. And so I think it's very important be before you go outside that we stick together and don't uh, judge already our midwives that are doing something different than the 90% of midwives that are in an organization. I see that for instance in Bulgaria too. I mean, they, they try to say we are the midwives and you're not. And so I think this so solidarity within the groups is very important too, and learn about the mistakes altogether. Then, then we can fight much more the outside world and, and instead of judging each other. Okay, last question, because we, uh, I'm sure that you're hungry. <laughs> or a comment. Rather, I'm not sure if it should be now or in the lawyers' meeting, but I wanted to, con to, um, to report that we have uh, got very good results from uh, the Human Rights Committee, which also has an uh, interim measures procedure, and uh, after convictions, uh, all things changed in, in, uh, inside the country. We got a conviction, 
after from the from the HRC and an interim measure in a um, case um, of expulsion of Roma uh, cit uh, citizens um, from their uh, from, from their territory and uh, all the prosecutors, uh, all the lawsuits had gone uh, to the file and everything was, uh, was silenced inside Greek jurisdiction and after that we went to court again, we, put, uh, we, pro we, we, we invoked procedures of accountability after everything was closed so this was very embarrassing for them too. Um, Concerning um, birth rights, I, I had also a very, a very a sad experience from the European Court of Human Rights, where I'm very, very active. Uh, and the fact that the European Court uh, pro promotes and uh, communicates to the government uh, like hundreds of applications of mine and not birth rights was really hard. It was 18 uh, women. Um, I'm from Greece. Um, Greece has the uh, highest, uh, we will talk about this cesarean section uh, um, uh, rates, and uh, these women uh, could not actually go to court like in Ternovsky uh, because of uh, prosecutions of midwives, of, of prosecutions of parents uh, and profiling of parents to the, uh, by the services uh, because uh, of uh, not disposing of their placentas properly. Uh, because of not, yes, they were accused of pollution of the environment, dozens of parents. So this was their way to tackle um, home birth uh, indirectly because it is not forbidden in Greece. So this, this was, this was uh, big and uh, it was uh, one of the two applications that I have eaten in my face, <laughs> right? Yes, with no explanation, as you said, uh, without uh, explanation. For, and this is a problem, I, I believe this is a problem for all uh, countries that lack regulatory uh, frame. And I was afraid of that, although I had provoked uh, parliamentary control invoking the Ternovsky and saying that what will we do, dear uh, uh, fellow parliament members, because we do not have any laws uh, regulating this and supporting women. And uh, uh, have you heard of the Ternovsky case in the parliament? Or even if we provoked that, uh, we got it back, uh, obviously because of exhaustion of non-exhaustion of remedies. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure that you're starving <laughs> by this time, so please join us for lunch, and we'll come back in an hour. <laughs>